Um, yeah, so I appreciate everybody coming today. Um, my name is Joe Nicastro. I am a solutions architect for Sonatype. Um, largely goal for today is kind of kind of be to talk to you about software supply chains, uh, what we're seeing as far as those software supply chains, different types of attacks that we're seeing, um, and then to do a workshop uh, where we'll actually go through uh, the Struts 2 RCE that was uh, what took down uh, Equifax uh, a few years ago. Um, so with that, I, I think the, one of the places that I, I really want to start is, uh, go ahead and click that, why, why are we building software, right? And I think when, when you talk about organizations building software, uh, it really comes down to two reasons. Um, I would say it's largely innovation and value, right? Uh, innovation for the organization to build new things uh, and then providing that value for customers or, or you know, the organization itself. Um, and, and I think in that goal, uh, it's always you know, uh, the goal of the business to, to create those, that innovation and value as fast as possible, uh, again, for their customers or for that organization. Um, and I think that's why largely we've seen, you know, over the last few years, um, there be a, a large change um, in the way that we've gone about developing, right? So this is just a, a, a little cartoon that uh, I pulled from XKCD that, that really shows somebody sitting around going, hey, you know, I, I thought about that five years ago and I never got around to building it and, and this other company built it and, you know, I, I want a piece of that idea. And, and that's largely why I think uh, companies are uh, trying to innovate and, and create code uh, substantially faster is so that they're able to get these, uh, these products and, and that value to their customers faster than other companies are. Right. So again, um, like I said, I, I think that's largely the reason why we've seen this this shift in the way that we're going about developing uh, as we move forward. Right. We're seeing things like at first it was you know going from uh, waterfall development to agile, uh, and then moving from agile to DevOps, and now we're starting to see DevSecOps so that we can kind of kill those silos, uh, automate substantially more, uh, and again get uh, get that value to your customers substantially faster. Right. Um, so one of the ways that I, I think that we've largely seen this shift in, um, in development over the last 10 years is with open source software, right? Uh, before 10 years, uh, you know, pre prior to that, uh, the last decade, we really saw developers creating a lot of stuff on their own. It was all first party code. Um, and, and really, you just had a lot of people recreating the wheel over and over and over again. Um, and we've seen a, a, a shift towards more developers pulling in open source libraries, packages, et cetera, into their code, largely to give them that ability to, uh, again, provide that value to their customers substantially faster, not have to go about rec recreating that wheel, um, et cetera. And, and to that point, we've actually seen Again, some, some really large shifts. Um, you know, just in, in some of the research that we've done, we're seeing that most modern applications nowadays are built with almost 90% open source software, which means that really your developers are just writing about 10% first party code. Everything else is something they're pulling from a public repository uh, or, or inner source or something like that. Um, you know, in, in 2020, we saw about a, a trillion and a half open source downloads uh, from Java, NPM, PyPy, uh, Ruby Gems, et cetera, uh, which is a, a substantially uh, a substantial large amount of, of open source, especially when you're talking about, you know, the entire pool of developers is somewhere around 25 and a half million. Uh, so you're looking at about 50 or 60,000 open source develop, uh, you know, open source packages that are being developed, downloaded by your developers in a year. Um, just just last year, uh, you know, again, we saw almost 380,000 Java components uh, downloaded by a normal average company, right? So just one company is downloading almost 380,000 packages uh, from a single, uh, you know, a single Java repository. So you, you can just kind of see the, the scale of the numbers that we're starting to talk about uh, when we're talking about this open source ecosphere and, and, and securing your software supply chain. Now, the great thing about this is that it has made it substantially faster for us to build software. Um, you know, it, it's much easier to go online, find these packages, and bring them in. Uh, the downside is that most modern architecture uh, looks like this picture that you're seeing here. It's kind of a, a Jenga block of, uh, of, of Jenga block stack of, of applications and different projects that are being pulled in. Um, you know, and, and most people don't realize that this is how their applications are coming together, right? Typically, companies, uh, you know, are, are planning to hire one Java developer. Uh, they don't realize that, you know, most of the time, uh, a singular package uh, could potentially rely on 30 to 40 different types of open source dependencies being pulled in with that. So, you know, when you're looking for that one Java developer to bring in to write your code, uh, you're not actually bringing in just one de Java developer. You're bringing in, you know, 30 or 40 who are also maintaining all of these transitive dependencies. Uh, 
uh, again that are being brought in. Um, so, so uh, again, you can see that you know it, it can definitely make some precarious situations when you have that one pro that one project or that one package or component that you're bringing in that's holding up all the rest of your application, and that that component just so happens to be being maintained by some guy in the middle of the country as a second job, uh, and 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 he's the only one that's maintaining it, right? Um, so uh, again, while there's great, uh, you know, there's good sides to to being able to develop faster, bringing in this open source is is, is really awesome. Uh, it definitely brings about some downsides. Um, you know, we we just published a report called the uh, the 2020 uh, software, sorry, state of software supply chain uh, report, and one of the the key numbers that really stuck out to me is that we're seeing almost a 650 percent year over year increase in software supply chain attacks. Um, and, and largely that's because a lot of these repositories aren't really uh, doing the necessary checks and stuff like that to verify that people aren't putting in, uh, you know, name conf or dependency confusion packages or malware into these packages, um, et cetera, right? Uh, so you can see just some numbers here. Uh, you know, one in 10 open source components that have been downloaded contain some known security vulnerability, right? And, and when we're talking about the numbers that we were just re referencing earlier, where you potentially have a developer that's downloading 50 or 60,000 open source packages in a year, um, you know, one in 10 that are coming down that have software security vulnerabilities, you can start seeing the amount of security debt that you're building within an organization. Um, you know, another number that kind of sticks out is this one in five organizations that have experienced a, a, a breach due to open source software in the last 12 months. Um, that's one in five companies that have openly admitted to that. I'm sure that that number is probably substantially higher just because most companies don't like to share the fact that they've been breached by, by something, right? Um, so you, you can see just how widespread of an issue uh, th this can possibly be um, and, and understand why this is, this is starting to become a substantially more uh, a larger concern for organizations. Um, so just some examples that we've seen you know, over uh, the, the last few months, right? Uh, we had this Code Cove incident where somebody uh, was able to get a password and because they got a password to the inner uh, CICD systems, they were able to inject some malicious code into Code Cove, uh, which then allowed that, that particular open source package to be uh, dispersed amongst a number of different companies, uh, which called, uh, caused a, a large amount of breaches, right? Um, and, and again, this, is, this attack vector is just only getting substantially more prevalent. Um, another one that we just recently saw was the attack on uh, the Confluence servers. Uh, again, they had an open source package that had a vulnerability in it, um, and, and because of that, you know, a lot of Confluence customers ended up getting, uh, getting attacked, uh, one of which dropped 500,000 Fortinet VPNs uh, so that they could see all those passwords, right? Uh, so I, again, the, you can see that you know, not only is the, the numbers of open source uh, that we're dealing with staggering, but the, again, the vulnerability security debt that you're bringing in uh, is extremely staggering as well and could cause not only issues for your organization but uh, really a, a downstream effect for all the organizations that you happen to, uh, to work with as well. Uh, another great example um, is uh, there was a PyPy package that we just uh, actually located uh, not too long ago. Uh, that was being downloaded by developers, and once it was downloaded onto their machine, was actually going and mining cryptocurrency on their machines. Um, another package uh, from PyPy that was just recently removed as well uh, was actually getting downloaded by developers and then was going through their machine to steal credit card numbers and, uh, and network passwords, right? So you can see it's a, it's a really easy path for somebody to get into your system via a developer that downloaded something that they didn't realize was malicious and then really just make their way uh, through, through the rest of your organization if need be. So because of all of the, the changes that we're seeing, um, you know, we just recently saw Biden uh, issue an executive order, uh, mainly to do a couple of things. One, to make sure that anything's being sold to the government, is, it now has an SBOM or a software bill of materials so that they can actually see exactly what in, is included in that particular piece of application and understand all the components that make it up. Um, they're also going to be starting to create some NIST guidelines um, so that we can have a better uh, understanding of what needs to be done within organizations in order to secure secure uh, this software supply chain, right? Um, 
in the end, it all really comes down to this, right? It, evil hackers, are they're getting smarter and faster. Um, and with software supply chain attacks, it's substantially easier for me as an attacker to poison the well of a single spot like an NPM library or a PyPy library and hope that that gets downloaded by hundreds of organizations and then use that as an attack vector into those organizations than it is for me to really spend six months, eight months doing a bunch of OSINT on a particular organization to find out what you know, weaknesses they may have um, and, and try to infiltrate them that way, right? So it, it's really a, a low risk, high reward avenue for attackers, which I think is one of the reasons why we're seeing this, uh, you know, get substantially more prevalent. So it, this is really just a picture of what we consider the full spectrum software supply chain, right? All the different entry points or areas that, you know, potential things could happen. Um, again, with software supply chain attacks, we're seeing a lot of stuff come into uh, this public OSS repo. So again, PyPy, NPM, uh, Maven, et cetera. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely people just uploading some malicious packages there, um, as well as just natural vulnerabilities that are being created by developers as they're building out these open source projects because they're not uh, you know, security experts in it and of themselves. So as they're building out some of this functionality, uh, there's potential for them to be uh, basically creating security debt for your organization as you're building out these applications. Right. Uh, a couple of other places that you know we're seeing things. You know, obviously, first-party code. As you guys are creating your own code, you could be introducing uh, your own security debt. Um, but then even, you know, even when we start talking about uh, the packaging process, right, there's a lot more attacks that are starting to take place where, uh, again, attackers are trying to get into your CI, CD systems, et cetera, uh, so that they can make those changes or in inject malicious code during your build processes without you knowing before you even go to ship that, that particular product. And then lastly, as you're operating these, uh, these applications, right, and they're in production, um, there's, there's definitely often times where, uh, you know, there may not be security risks before you put that in production, uh, but then as that code ages and as other people find uh, particular, you know, zero days or vulnerabilities, uh, et cetera, then that becomes an issue, right? A great, a great example of this was the Struts2 uh, RCE that came out with, with Equifax, right? Uh, there was a lot of companies that were using uh, Struts, that Struts2 version at the time. Uh, it wasn't an issue before, and then all of a sudden a zero day got uh, got published about that particular uh, package, and within days um, there was already a, a large amount of companies that were getting breached uh, to a to a qu quite a deep extent. Right? A again, Equifax being one of them. So with that said, um, I'm going to do a quick workshop walkthrough of what that Struts2 RCE actually looks like um, and kind of show you guys what you know, actually happened during that particular attack. Um, this is being recorded, so there's, there's absolutely no need for you guys to like, try to keep up or anything like that. Um, and, and again, so if you, you know, want to follow along on your own uh, afterwards, you can. Uh, there are a couple of requirements that were set up uh, that you need to set up in order to have this uh, this RCE work. Um, one, you'd need Python 3. Um, in this particular example, we're using Tomcat 7, which does require Java 1.8 uh, as far as a JDK. So you may need to kind of bump your your Java version uh, behind. Uh, and then any kind of uh, any kind of Git account. It doesn't necessarily need to be GitHub, GitLab, uh, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Azure uh, DevOps. Again, anywhere that you can really fork over a repository uh, so that you can copy this on your own. Um, and then I, I'm using Docker installed on my own, my own local machine to kind of build out some containers to show this. Uh, and then lastly, I'm using Visual Studio Code. But again, you're, you're more than welcome to use whatever ID you'd like. Um, as far as the, the setup goes uh, and kind of what we'll be doing, uh, the very first thing that, that you would need to do is go ahead and fork this particular GitHub project. I've already gone ahead and done that. Um, and then from there, uh, you would clone that project to your workstation. Uh, again, I've already taken care of that process. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and build and run the, the Docker image while we're here. And then I'll walk you through what that exploit looks like and show you some of the, uh, uh, the damage that can be done with an exploit like this. So with that said, uh, here's the kind of the instructions and, and what we're going to basically go through and do. Uh, very first step is we're going to go ahead and package uh, this particular application. Uh, then we'll go ahead and, and create a Docker image, uh, and, and then we'll start running that Docker image. From there, we're going to create a virtual environment within Python, uh, download some requirements that are needed for this particular exploit, uh, and then from there, we can go ahead and run the exploit. Right? Uh, so, 
sorry, let's uh, go back. And with that said, let me go ahead and pull up my virtual, my, my uh, Visual Studio code, right? Um, so again, I've already gone ahead and forked that GitHub repository. I've already cloned it to my machine. Um, you can see basically the steps are in the readme. Uh, there's a, a number of files here that have things like your Docker file, which will already uh, automatically build out that, uh, that particular Docker image. Uh, the POM file is what's going to be you know, uh, used for uh, us building this particular Java application. Uh, and then there's a requirements text here uh, for when we go ahead and pull down those, those Python requirements for the actual exploit. So with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I'm going to do is this, uh, this Maven uh, clean package. Uh, and again, we're just basically going to go here and build through, uh, if I can actually type correctly, bear with me. Uh, we're going to build out this, uh, this uh, Java package. So basically, this is going to go through. It's going to go out and reach out to these, these repositories, pull down all the necessary dependencies, um, all the uh, different files that are needed to build out this. And then it's going to go ahead and build us out, out of war. Uh, we've got our build successful, so we're good to go. Uh, very next thing that I'm going to go ahead and do is, is build this Docker image. Um, so before I do, just, just to kind of show you what, we, what, what I'm running right now. Uh, so when I run a Docker PS, you can see I'm, I'm only running one container at the moment. This happens to be a, what I use is, is called Portainer. It's, it's just a, a middleware that allows me to access my containers in a more user-friendly way. Um, but from here, I can go ahead and do a, a Docker build. We'll go ahead and build uh, this box, and we'll call it HackMe. Uh, and again, we're just using the Docker file that's in this, in this particular project uh, to go ahead and build that out. That's going to go through, and that's going to pull in all of the, uh, again, uh, Docker files, uh, all the uh, necessary um, images, and, and then go ahead and run some of those commands to get everything up and running. Once we're done from there, I can actually do a, uh, a Docker run. We're going to run this in the background, uh, and we're going to change this to port 999 instead of 8080, just because I already have something running on 8080. And then we can go ahead and hit Enter. Um, and apparently, I misspelled something. Oh, I, I got to put the, the actual box right, tell it what, uh, what box we want to run. So we're going to run that HackMe box. And now that that's running, I can do a, a Docker PS, uh, make sure that that's running right. And I can see my, my HackMe box right here uh, is called Condescending Hoover, right? Um, so we'll go ahead and clear that out. So now that I, go, now that I have that actually built out, uh, I can start setting up uh, my particular virtual environment. And uh, I do apologize. I need to kind of jump back here and just grab some, some commands from here because I was hoping to have multiple screens, but it didn't work out that way. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and previous. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is grab a uh, virtual environment. So we're going to create this in uh, this VNV folder. Uh, and again, that's just going to basically put us into a virtual environment. This might take a second. Once we've done that, uh, the very next thing is we're going to run this VENV scripts activate. Uh, know that this is shell specific, right? So on my particular machine, this is what I need to do to run my shell. If you guys are running Fish or you know some other operating system with another shell, uh, that command may change. Um, but again, uh, you know, it's largely just going to be uh, shell specific. So we'll go ahead and oh, let's try that again. Go ahead and. And then it was, bear with me, uh, scripts, activate, love tab completion. And now that we're in our uh, virtual environment, we can actually start doing things within here, like download requirements, uh, dependencies, et cetera, for that particular Python executable. Uh, so in this case, again, we're just going to do a pip install. We're going to grab that requirements.txt. Try that again. There we go. Requirements.txt. Uh, this is going to go through and again grab all of those different dependencies, bring them down f to allow us to actually run this particular exploit. I am not, not yet. I, I'm not in that Docker container yet. Uh, however, that Docker container is running, right? So if I come over here and I do, uh, let's just jump into Google Chrome, right? And I can do a localhost uh, and we set that to 999. And I can come over here to orders dash three, right? So this is that container as it's running, right? This is, again, just basically an Apache struts uh, web page. I can come over here and go back to my orders. If I wanted to, I can add or delete things from the repository uh, or from the database, et cetera. 
Um, so now that I'm in my virtual environment, I've got all my, uh, my, my uh, Python uh, requirements stored. At this point, I can actually start running that command, right? Uh, so you'll see the command here. It's going to be Python exploit py, and then we're going to tell it where we want to run that. Uh, and then from there, I can inject any command that I want to, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. And then it's going to be... orders three and then again whatever it is that I want to run so maybe maybe I want to just see what I I is in this particular file at first I can run this LS um, and apparently I did not uh, run that command right let's interesting let's try that Oh, I misspelled orders. There we go. Got to love uh, those typing errors, right? Um, so in this particular case, right, I'd, all I did was run an LS. Basically, I just want to see what I have access to on this particular container, right? And you can see that it's giving me all of the different files that I have. I've got my, my building.txt, my contributing, my licensing, uh, et cetera, right? So, so maybe, maybe let's, let's go a little bit deeper, right? Like maybe I want to show me what kind of machine I'm running, right? And now I can start seeing all of the, you know, actual files directly on, on my root, um, you know. And, and so now let's just do something like a who am I? And you can see that I'm, I'm root on this box, right? So with this exploit, I can basically do whatever I want to this container, uh, largely because it's running this older version of struts too. Now one thing that I do want to point out here um, is that this particular exploit doesn't run inside of your, your call flow, right? So one of the things that you'll see a lot of tools out there do is they'll help you prioritize using that call flow analysis. Um, and in some instances, like for this particular vulnerability, it may miss that or give you a false negative or even prioritize this a little bit lower uh, because, again, this is not something that's going to be run in particular call flow. But as you can see, it's still exploitable despite the fact that this particular function is not called within whatever application it is that you're building, right? Um, so it does, it does leave you fairly open. Um, so with that, I, you know, we, again, if there's any questions, we'll have some time at the end. We can kind of discuss through, you know, what, what all just happened here. Um, but again, you can kind of see the devastation that can happen when you have uh, some of these libraries or open source packages that you're bringing in uh, and, and basically leaving holes into your organization. So with that said, um, you know, here at Sonotype, we, we have a couple of different ways that we can help out with this. Um, one of the ways that we can, we can help out with this is using our OSS index. This is a completely free tool that's open to uh, all of the developer community. Um, there's a number of different places that, that this can be put into. Uh, so, you know, within your, your IDE, you can actually run these scans, uh, again, directly in that IDE. Uh, a good example of this would be down here. Uh, you'll see if I expand out this Sonotype um, this Sonotype scan results, it's going to list out all of the different packages that we have here. Um, it, it, again, does multi-languages, so you'll see I've got some Maven packages, I've got some, uh, some Python packages, etc. I can click on any one of these, and it'll give me a list of what those vulnerabilities look like. Um, so I can actually start looking into, all right, what vulnerability this particular package has, etc. Um, so if I jump over to security, uh, again, you'll see a list of these CVEs. I can expand these out and kind of drill down a little bit more and get some additional information on, on what CVEs this particular package uh, may contain. Um, so that's, that's definitely one way uh, that, that we can handle this. Um, and again, you can, you can install these tools within our, uh, your build process, so in CICD, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, a good example of this, and I'll show you guys momentarily, is we have a tool called Ahab uh, that will actually do a scan on your Docker images as you're building them and actually will break the build if that Docker image is bringing in any kind of OS level or component vulnerabilities. So what is the OSS in index? Um, it, it's largely, a, again, just a, a scan that's going to give you a, the ability to see a list of all of the vulnerabilities uh, that are found within any of the packages that you're bringing in within an application or a container, um, et cetera. Uh, you'll see it's going to give you things like your vulnerability score. It'll give you your CVE rating. It'll give you some information on that CVE. Uh, again, like we mentioned, these tools are completely free and available to all of your, your developer community. Uh, these tools are built by Sonotypers as well as uh, additional Sonotype community uh, members. 
And as far as languages go, uh, you can see a list of the languages that are supported with these tools. Um, each one of them uh, kind of runs a different language. Uh, the one that I'm going to show you in a moment is Ahab, and Ahab really works on, uh, like we talked about, that base OS. We're looking at, again, containers uh, and any kind of flaws that may be being brought in uh, by uh, the packages that happen to be built into that particular container. Um, if you're interested in any of these tools, you can, you can grab them and play around with them uh, on your own. Uh, there's a link down here, this, this ossindex.sonatype.org uh, uh, slash integrations, um, and, and again, have at it and you know, play around with them. If you have any questions, let us know. We're, we're more than happy to kind of discuss them with you. Um, and so like I had mentioned earlier, one of the tools that could have prevented this particular attack uh, is, is called Ahab. Uh, and, and again, you can build these directly into your build, uh, into your build rules, right? So as you're, uh, again, setting up a Docker file or something like that, uh, just put this scanner directly in there so that while it's going through that, <coughs> excuse me, it can go ahead and, and, and do that scan and determine if there is anything uh, wrong. So for instance, let's, let's go back over here to uh, this particular Docker file. I can go ahead and uncomment out uh, these two particular lines. Um, and then from here, let's go ahead and do a Docker, get back in here. Uh, let's go do a Docker PS and then just want to see what all we have available. And then from here, I will do a Docker kill and we'll kill that, uh, package. It looks like it's condescending. I love the names. The names are my favorite. Right, so we'll go ahead and I do I? <laughs> I do love the names until you have to spell them out. There we go. All right, so we went ahead and killed that box. If I go ahead and do a Docker PS, you'll see that box is no longer running. So let's go ahead and do another Docker build now that we have those, uh, those lines uncommented. And you'll see it's going to go through and build, um, and why? Oh, ah, I apologize. I forgot to save my file. Let's try that one more time. I apologize. So let's go ahead and do a Docker PS. Uh, it's not running. Let's do that Docker build again. Uh, T, it's going to be hack me. There we go. So now, and now you can see it's running that, that, that Ahab scanner. Uh, and, and essentially, because it found vulnerabilities, it went ahead and, and completely stopped that, that uh, and failed out that build, right? So you can see here, there's a, a lot of vulnerabilities, not just the particular struts one that, that I was showing you. Uh, but again, this is going to give you a, a list of uh, all of the different things that we found. It'll give you a description. Uh, it'll give you a CVSS score. It's also going to kind of point you to a link uh, that'll give you some additional information here. Um, so you can see that, yeah, again, you can kind of build these tools into your workflow to prevent any of these uh, particular large security issues from being brought in and kind of start failing these builds earlier on in, in your development life cycle. Sweet. So uh, on top of our, uh, our free tools, uh, our OSN, OSS index tools, uh, we also do offer some paid products, uh, again, full spectrum software supply chain management. Um, and really the difference uh, being is that uh, in addition to us giving you the vulnerability information uh, with our free tools, uh, our paid tools will give you remediation information for those vulnerabilities. So now we'll start telling you things like, hey, if you jump to you know version XYZ, it's not only going to fix this particular direct dependency that you're bringing in, but it's also going to fix all of the transitive dependencies that may go along with it. We also give you things like licensing information, <clears throat> so you can start building policies around whether or not you want your developers bringing in things like AGPL licensing or GPL licensing, um, et cetera, right? So you can start banning or, or setting up uh, different rules for, uh, again, what licenses are allowed, as well as different architectural information. So we actually start looking at, uh, you know, different different teams as they're building out these open source projects to determine how often are they fixing things? How often are they upgrading things? Is this, you know, is this particular, uh, you know, package really old and maybe something that you don't want to bring in because it's, you know, five, 10 years old and you want something newer? Uh, again, we can start doing, uh, you know, uh, things within your, your uh, software supply chain to block those, warn you of those, those items as well. 
Um, so, and like I was mentioning, uh, again, with our Nexus lifecycle, which is the paid version of that OSS index, uh, we'll start giving you things like popularity. How popular is that package and, and how many other people are using that, that version of a package? Um, are there things like breaking changes? If you need to upgrade to a newer dependency, is that going to go ahead and break uh, you know, that change? Are you going to need to refactor the code? Um, and, and then again, also giving you things like remediation advice where we'll tell you, hey, you know, the next version you should really jump to is, is this version because it fixes all of those vulnerabilities, fixes all those licensing issues, et cetera, um, and, and, and will help you have a better product uh, going forward, right? Um, the other thing that I'll point out is uh, obviously we understand fully that developers and you know uh, ops people they, they like to live in the tools that they they use quite a bit right so we integrate with all of those tools um, like you just saw with uh, Visual Studio uh, again we have a number of different IDE plugins that we integrate with uh, both with our free tools and our paid tools um, as far as build tools we you know integrate directly in with Jenkins and, and GitLab um, you know Azure DevOps etc we also have a number of different <coughs> excuse me, source code management um, or SCM integrations where we can actually do things like run scans and then push uh, pull requests directly into your, you know, your GitHub repositories or your GitLab repositories so that your developers can see those, those, uh, that remediation advice right where they live on a regular basis. So with that said, um, that's, that's all I've got. I'm happy to open it up to questions. I know that was probably a little quicker than... Uh, than I thought it was going to be, but I, again, any questions, thoughts, things that uh, you guys would like to know a little bit more about? Hopefully, this resonated with with everybody. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So, so the OSS index tools. <coughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, the question was whether or not uh, that OSS index, uh, where it was getting its information, um, and whether or not that was a, a SaaS product or uh, something that's being done on-premise. Um, so uh, with, with the OSS index tools, our free developer tools, um, uh, again, those are, all, those are all free for you to kind of download and, and operate within your own environment. The actual, remedia, uh, the actual uh, vulnerability information that we're pulling is coming from our uh, online database. Um, and, and really all we're doing is passing along a hash. So we're going through and identifying each of these open source uh, projects. We're giving them a fingerprint and then we're literally just sending that fingerprint up uh, to that database to match off and then send all that vulnerability data down. So we're not, we're not actually sending out you know, your particular source code or anything like that up to, uh, up to this database to get those results back. Yeah, no problem. Great question. Everybody else good to go? All right. Sweet. Well, hopefully, uh, like I said, hopefully this resonated with you. Hopefully uh, you guys got some good information out of this. If there's anything else that I can help out with or any questions that I can answer you know, as you guys are moving forward, um, let me know. Feel free to reach out to us, and uh, we're happy to help. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate it.